Well, my, my family, it was uh, my, my father and my brothers, we were all river people. We fished, fished the river mostly. And then before the seaway, we had a beautiful fishery. They still say it is, but it was nothing to the way it was. Back in the 50s, it was unreal. The water was clean, very clear. It used to be good. It used to be to where you could see a lot, um, a great distance underwater. And you could see, you could see the bottom very well. You could see sturgeon laying down there. You could see all kinds of fish laying on the bottom, which you can't do today. And I remember drinking water out of the St. Lawrence uh, rowing across the Cornwall. Things are so much different now than they were back then. In 1954, construction began on the St. Lawrence Seaway project with a price tag of almost $500 million. The undertaking would cover almost 300 kilometers of navigation construction from Montreal to Lake Erie. The advantage to Aquizas Lono was a sudden availability of local employment. Let's say about 90% were from here. You know, from the rest, not just, not just on the Canadian side, there's about both the American side too, because there was a lot of iron workers that, that, that worked from here. And that was you know, like uh, gravy at that time, because usually you have to leave town to go to work. Huh? But some of the temperatures uh, in that winter that we worked through, some of us are 50 below zero. No? I worked on the COE, I worked over there on the Eisenhower Dam, and, uh, or Eisenhower Lock, and I was, uh, I used to be a cement vibrator. That was the only work that was around at that time. There was either building the plant at Reynolds or working uh, on, on the locks or whatever. More than 500 Canadian and American engineers directed construction by more than 20,000 workers of locks digging of canals, building of bridges, new roads and railways. The cost to Aquizas Lono included the erosion and flooding of their lands, toxic waste, and a complete disturbance of the ecosystem. Because they raised the water level, they flooded some of our islands west of the dam. And um, there's a few islands that were completely uh, uh, flooded, they were underwater, and um, they, um, those people that, that were living on there had to move. There was six sites on Cornwall Island where they dumped all that dredging from the river. A few years later, when they did uh, research on uh, you know, what, what damage was actually done, the Mohawk Council hired uh, specialists, you know, technicians, environmental uh, engineers and uh, they did a survey of uh, you know, testing uh, land land tests, you know, ground soil tests and uh, we showed them where the uh, dump sites were and they, they found some lead and uh, mercury and I think it was about four or five chemicals that were, you know, were still active in that soil. Construction was completed in 1959 with the official opening held on June 26th attended by the Queen and the U.S. President Dwight Eisenhower. It may as well say it changed our whole way of life here uh, for, most, for most fishermen and hunters that, that worked on the river. I used to fish right, right in, uh, my bay, in the bay next to my father's and my aunt's place. You know, there's, there was a bay right there. And you can, I think it's only about eight feet deep. So with my little rowboat, so I could see the bottom you know, like this. Ontario Power Generation accepted responsibility for the damage of the community's lands and way of life. A settlement of grievances against OPG was approved by the Mohawks of Aquisasne in a referendum held in 2008. But to this day, Haudenosaunee people struggle with what used to be. The scarring is already there. You know, the, the scarring that they did. I, I, I remember the day when my dad told me just before he passed. He said, when the day comes, I can't fish in the river anymore. Time for me to go. 